And with that, I'd like to say it is time now to begin with our third speaker. I had a chance to briefly inter get to know her a few minutes ago during our technical check. Um, we are going to be talking with the Aligning Form to Purpose, Meaningful Public Engagement from the Open Science Perspective. And our speaker will be Dr. Anna Fleur Schoenvig. Anna Fleur, are you there? Yes, I am. Great, I see you too. I'm gonna to change my screen here so that we can see each other a bit better. Excellent, excellent. And I'd like to briefly introduce you before you start your presentation. Yeah. Um, Anna Fleur works at the Rattenau Institute in the Netherlands as a senior researcher. She's an expert in the field of science and research policy, in particular, open science and public engagement with science. She has co-authored several studies on open science with the Rattenau Institute, and pre presented her work at several international meetings as well. Before she joined the Institute, she conducted her PhD research on a related topic, patient involvement in health research. In 2020-2021, Anna Fleur was seconded to the UNESCO headquarters in Paris. As an open science expert, she contributed to drafting the global UNESCO recommendation on open science which was adopted by its member states in November of 2021. Today, among other things, she will discuss the five directives to help policymakers and researchers design processes for meaningful public engagement. It is a great pleasure to welcome Anna Fleur Scholwink to our digital stage. Thank you, David. Yes. You're welcome. Yes. Um, so uh, let's delve right into it. Um, aligning for form to purpose, uh, we're going to uh, discuss a uh, which we think um, not so much highlighted uh, aspect of open science, which is um, public engagement in this talk. And um, before I start with um, the messages of, of today, I'll quickly introduce our institute, um, because I can imagine not, uh, not everyone knowing it so well. Um, the Rathenau Institute's mission is to stimulate the opinion formation um, of the public and politically on the societal aspects of science and technology. And to do so, we perform research and organizing the, the debate uh, relating to science innovation and new technologies. Um, so um, this is where I work, and this is the type of research we do. Um, it's academic work, but with a heavy societal component, so to say. Um, and um, I'm just going to give away my main messages of today uh, right away. Um, so uh, I'll uh, delve into deep uh, into these um, one by one consecutively. Um, first of all, we will discuss um, the open science goals um, and to which we think interaction between science and society is needed to achieve these goals. And then secondly, um, I'll discuss um, the meaningfulness of public engagement, when public engagement is meaningful. And we say it can, um, it can be considered mean meaningful when it contributes to the democratization of science. And then thirdly, we will discuss, um, I'll discuss um, how to achieve such meaningful public engagement. And that um, is through building a coherent story of the why, where, when, and how of, um, of public engagement. Um, so these will be the main messages of today and I'll just go through them one by one. So to start off with the goals of open science, um, if you ask the European Commission, um, they will say that open science is meant to achieve better science. And with better, they mean um, more efficient, more reliable science, and also a science that is more responsive to society's needs. Um, they say literally, I'll quote, um, open science increases the quality and impact of science by fostering reproducibility and is interdisciplinarity. It makes science more efficient uh, through better sharing of resources, more reliable through better verification and more responsive, responsive to society's needs. And if we look in the Dutch policy context, uh, context um, we will see that also here, this openness to society is central to open science. Um, it's uh, uh, open science or open scholarship stands for the transition to a new, more open and more inclusive way of conducting, publishing and evaluating scientific research. So you could say that 
um, this connection between science and society and strengthening this connection is one of the um, main goals amongst others, but it's one of the main goals of open science. Well, if we then turn to the operational, operationalization of open science, um, we see that a lot of researchers, a lot of policymakers, a lot of people studying open science will define open science much more in terms of open access, fair data sharing, pre-registration of clinical trials, open educational resources, open source um, of software. So it's much more um, uh, intended and much more, there's much more attention to the open sharing of data and knowledge amongst researchers and not so much between researchers and society. So basically we asked, and we were not the only ones, the question, what happened in the debate to the promises to open up science to society? And how can we as a research institute study this and contribute to this um, openness to society more? So that is why we decided to delve into public engagement, um, the connection between science and society as a two-way communication channel. Um, we, uh, our guiding principles, you could say, of our research were that public engagement is not a monolithic concept. It can be many things. It can be citizen science. It can mean um, defining public, um, uh, communicating with the public in different ways. Um, it can be defining the research agenda. It can be many things. So it's not monolithic. Um, we also um, had the hunch and also then um, studied how different scientific domains deal with public engagement in different ways. And if they do so, that means that they can learn from each other's engagement practices. Um, we felt that the, the public engagement should be meaningful. Tokenistic public engagement is actually counterproductive even. And all these uh, guiding principles led us to the aim to discern lessons for meaningful public engagement and provide courses of actions for all stakeholders uh, to facilitate and foster public engagement with science. We did this in um, uh, several projects. We worked on um, uh, public engagement in three different domains, very um, different in terms of type of research, in terms of types of uh, publics engaged. Uh, we studied public engagement um, in psych psychiatric research, in educational research, and in the research into water quality. Um, so these are very different topics of research, um, and they all involve the public in very different ways. And um, we bundled and um, synthesized these insights into our last review, which uh, is called uh, Moving Forward Together with Open Science. And it's recently been, uh, been translated to English and can also be found on our website. Um, and that is what I'll base um, this presentation most, most on. Um, so this is why we decided to focus on public engagement in the open science context. Um, then public engagement, I already said it a little bit, um, should be about meaningful public engagement. And this is not so much an outcome of our research, but it can be more, more seen as a guiding principle. Uh, we see it to be, me we consider it to be meaningful when it contributes to the democratization of, of science. Um, and I'll explain a little bit what we mean by, it, by this. Um, and in order to do so, I think it's necessary to explain first what the dangers of non-meaningful public engagement are. And that is what we call tokenism, or you could also say engagement for the sake of appearance. Tokenism um, can come in different forms and formats. Um, it can be allowing the public to only participate in discussions of little, uh, on, sub on subjects of little or no importance um, to the researchers. So I literally saw in one project that publics were allowed to um, uh, choose the name for a specific study and then not contribute at all to what the study was about or how it was conducted or how the results were implemented, just the name of the study. 
that is generally something for researchers, which is not very important. Um, but at least they could say, well, we listen to the, to the participants here, we listen to the public, and this is how we call our study. That is what we would call a tokenistic situation. It can also be that stakeholders do contribute um, valuable inputs, uh, but that these, input, these contributions are brushed aside uh, when they don't match the, the wishes or interests of the researchers. This is also what we would say is a tokenistic situation. And in these situations, um, you can say that um, citizens appear to be involved, but in fact contrib contribute little. And this has a demotivating effect on all stakeholders, on all those involved, because the effort um, expended in public engagement um, is of little value in the end. Um, and in the end, it can become just a tick boxing exercise um, to satisfy the wishes of the public funder, of the research funder. So what we aimed to do in this study is discuss um, how public engagement can be meaningful. And um, by saying this, we don't necessarily mean just greater or more engagement or just involving more people. Um, the point is not to engage citizens by in, in greater numbers, um, but it's the point is to engage them meaning, meaningfully. And defining meaningfully um, is uh, what we say um, contributing to the democratization of science. And this would involve three different aspects. Um, we say it involves accessibility and inclusivity of research. Um, and um, these are linked because um, the lower the thresholds you have to engage people, um, the more relevant groups um, are able to participate. And um, in saying relevant, diverse social groups, we really mean um, involving groups that actually also shape diversity in society. Um, and in this way, we go a little bit further than what the European Commission would say in their um, main documents on public engagement, um, because they say it's important to open up a project to anyone who is interested. Uh, we, see, we say that more effort is needed to achieve such inclusion. Um, you need to explicitly invite people who do not, do not directly seek access to scientific research themselves and to lower your barriers to their involvement. And then a third aspect of democratization also means ownership. It also means that you give people and stakeholders, and citizens, um, uh, to see them as um, partners in a research project and contributors of additional knowledge and skills. And they should, together with researchers, determine their own role and determine their own say in a research project. So this is what we mean by meaningful public engagement, but how to achieve such a, a meaningful engagement. That is where a coherent story of the why, who, where, when, and how to engage the public comes in. It's the building blocks basically of meaningful public engagement. And um, I'll just go through all of these elements first and to explain a little bit how these um, work together in, coherent, in a coherent way. And then that will also build the story to the five directives which we have identified to help this pu meaningful pu public engagement. So first of all, there's the question of why public engagement? And a lot of people will have heard about these instruments and about, uh, sorry, these um, arguments, but it's good to have them explicit and also to explicate them, to make them explicit each time you decide to cooperate with citizens or with um, stakeholders. Um, first of all, there's the group we, uh, of what we call instrumental arguments, where public engagement is in means to an end. And um, the end could be increased scientific literacy of the public, 
or it could be the introduction of new, fresh research perspectives, which you as a researcher didn't have, maybe. It could also improve the societal relevance of uh, science or lead to the increased support and uptake of research. In all these cases, um, public engagement is uh, a means to an end. It's an instrument, it's instrumental, you could say. Um, then there's also another category of arguments why to involve the public. And these are more democratic. Um, you could say that um, as the public, there is just the right to be involved in research. Um, and that is um, because we have a right to access and sharing of knowledge as defined in Article 27 of our Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It also leads to more emancipation and democratization in general. And you could also say um, public engagement or, or scientific research just affects people's lives. And that's why they should be, should have the right to be involved. So these are all more democratic arguments, more normative arguments, you could say, to engage the public. It's important to have these reasons why you would want to participate or why you would want to involve stakeholders to make these reasons expl explicit because they also contrib contribute to the form and the, the, the way you are engaging your publics. Um, because then the question arises, okay, we want to um, uh, engage the public for, for certain um, arguments. Um, who should be in engaged then? Um, these could be several different groups. We, we don't say that there is just one or a, a certain type of stakeholder who should be engaged. It could be, it could be different groups. Um, it could be citizens, the general public, basically, of whom you could say they probably have little specific knowledge on a research topic. Um, they have no specific stake um, and they will be inclined to do simple um, repetitive tasks. Um, a lot of citizen science in the narrow sense of the word um, uh, comes down to involving citizens in this way. You could also um, want to engage amateur scientists. And I realize that this little comic is in Dutch, so I'm sorry, but I'll translate for you. Um, uh, one uh, professor asks the other, at which, un which university are you employed? And then the other one says, at the University of Life. So um, these amateur scientists uh, have probably some knowledge, sometimes very on a very specific top topic, and they will be more uh, eager to do more intensive and more uh, demanding tasks. Um, then there's also professionals, asking professionals on their input is also a, a form, you could say, of uh, public engagement. And last but not least, there's activists who will be willing to contribute to science or to uh, contribute to a research project because they want to influence the research agenda. They have their own um, goal and they want to achieve this goal, societal goal, by participating in research and influencing research agenda. Um, these can also can all be different groups. Um, it can also be different various groups in, in the same research project, uh, but it's important to realize who you're dealing with and um, what you can ask from them. Then this might sound like a, a, a little bit redundant question. Why does it make it really matter where the engagement actually takes place. Well, we say it is a question to be asked um, because it's important to realize whether you're in, um, uh, organizing a physical collaboration or more a virtual one. And it's also important to realize the importance of a neutral meeting space, especially, for example, in medical research, uh, where you see that um, the medical power relations in a healthcare setting are completely different than the power relations in a research setting. Um, so meeting up in a hospital where the patient generally feels a little bit more powerless may, might not be the best idea to then have an equal co 
um, conversation between you as a scientific researcher and the patient as a patient representative. So it's important to realize what the location can do to your conversation. Um, then there's the question when and how to be engaged. And we um, uh, took these questions together because in the end, it can be that in different phases of your research, you give people a different role. So at the left side of this slide, we have the very well-known um, uh, research cycle, starting from the setting of the agenda, which questions are you actually asking, um, and then ending at implementing your research, um, and the research results. And then all these different phases of the research, um, we would say that research uh, that public engagement is possible and can be worthwhile. Um, and how it can be in diff at different levels. Generally, I'm not a very big fan of this participation ladder of Arnstein, um, starting from informing to empowering the, at the top because it implies some kind of hierarchy that higher up, it's better to be um, involved because there's more power. Um, what I'm more... Um, um, inclined, I would be more inclined to say, is that it can be different at different stages. So in the agenda setting phase, people could be empowered to contribute to, to, to set the agenda. And in the analyzing data, they could be involved and that could be fine. It doesn't have to be always exactly in the same levels. Um, so that is why we decided to take this when and how together. So then in the end, we say it's about building a coherent story. It's not about having an IKEA guideline of how to follow a recipe um, to have meaningful public engagement. We would say it's much more about legal. Um, we have the building blocks and you have to make a coherent story out of it. And doing so means choosing the right building blocks to what you want to build. Um, so that is why we would say that you need all these elements and you need to think about all these elements. Well, um, trying to connect these building blocks to the democratic ideal of open science, which it clearly has in its goals, we have five directives uh, towards meaningful public engagement. The first one is make research accessible and inclusive right, for diverse um, audiences. And that is by minimizing uh, the research jargon, academic language, and by translating insights from research as much as possible into useful applications for practice. Then the second directive is about coordinating diversity, um, involving participants uh, of diverse backgrounds and providing insights into the added value of these diverse perspectives. The third uh, directive is incentivizing researchers to evolve audiences. Um, providing adequate reward structures is part of this. Fourthly, um, you have to make expect expectations explicit. You have to evaluate them and reflect on public engagement. Uh, joint reflection can lead to interim adjustments to research uh, projects. That is what you need. You need flexibility. Um, and then uh, lastly, uh, we would say that citizens should be given ownership of their own role and um, having a say in their research. And this means that connecting these building blocks means it's a challenge for both the academic domain, but it's also a challenge to um, the societal realm to have meaningful public engagement. So it's um, basically... Um, for, for both sides of the, um, of the, at the bridge, we need to build to, to get together. Um, so these are our, our um, ideas on how to achieve meaningful public engagement. And I'm very willing to answer this uh, questions and discuss our findings with you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Anna Floor. I can tell you already, we have many questions coming in. So let me get right to the Q&A. We have about 10 minutes for that. 
Let's see if we can see that here on our screen. I have a split screen. Give me one moment to make sure I can see what everyone else is seeing. Yes, I do see it there. Uh, one can moment. I um, okay. stop well, sharing? Go ahead and read the first question. Go ahead. Well, I set, set that here. Go ahead and read the first one. Um, yes, I need to stop sharing my screen, then I can also read it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry, maybe you can read it for me. It's very. No, no I'm, I'm trying to get to it too. Last time I had a few clicks to get to that. Give me one moment. We'll get there. I've got my speaker. We can get yes, the question. I see it. You see it? Okay, go ahead. I'm still playing. Did the COVID-19 pandemic change the role and or relevance of public engagement? Um, that's a very uh, good question. Um, I would say uh, thank you very much for this, uh, for this discussion point even. Um, because I would say that uh, what is interesting about the COVID-19 pandemic and the COVID-19 research, of course, is that it was translated very readily, readily into policy. And that means that um, the, the translation phase from scientific research, basic scientific research then applied into um, policy was much shorter, of course, because we just had to build on what was known. And um, in order to um, facilitate this and in order to keep people's trust in, um, in science, I would say that it's very important to keep involving the public and engaging with the public um, and not to revert back to some kind of fast forward track and just doing it by yourself because it's faster. Um, but to, to, uh, to, to keep this connection with society. So I hope that's part of the, of the answer, but there's much, much more you could say about this, I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Let's have our next question. And uh, hopefully I have here a different question that's in the chat, uh, just for my technical team. Um, the, I have a different order. So I'm gonna ask you to read the question that's underneath there again, just to make sure we're answering the same one. Go ahead, please, Anna Floor. Yes, so the question I see here is, in order to change the research system to more sensible public engagement, where do you see these responsibilities to initiate change? It is, is it the funders defining clear criteria, i.e. rewarding public engagement, I think. I'm sorry, I can't read the last line, but... <laughs> um, so about- yeah. Just to let you know, I have the function. I figured it out. It's dealing with pinning. That's no problem. In order to change the research systems towards sensible public engagement, where do you see the responsibility to initiate change? Is it the funders defining clear criteria, i.e. rewarding public engagement? Yes, yeah. Okay. Um, yes, it is. Um, I would say it's a system responsibility, uh, which means that it is partly a funders responsibility. Um, it is also partly, um, of course, the research institute's responsibility. Um, you could also say there is a even moral responsibility of researchers themselves. Um, and, and that is something which we also should not ignore. It's also part, the bridge should be built from both sides. So it's also part, you could say, of the of society, societal's responsibility. And then I make that concrete into um, this responsibility of civil society organizations, for example, to reach out to, to, um, to researchers. To, so it should be both ways. And um, professional organizations, civil society organizations should also um, uh, be open to be engaged in science. Mm. It's very interesting, just to let you know, I do some coverage about the European Union and this discussion is also similar, how to get public engagement towards the EU. And there's all kinds of discussions about how do you get the public emotionally interested and in actually seeing what the benefits are in the EU, not just in times of crisis. So I see a lot of parallels on that. Excellent. Good. I we have a few more questions here. Um, the next question, how do you cope with the involvement of activists from anti-scientific groups, believers in conspiracy theories, Novak's attitude, flat earthers, Certainly something we have uh, witnessed very much over the last year or two. Um, yes, I would say um, people who believe in 
alternative theories, so to say, um, they might not be um, the first one so responsive to have a conversation on scientific facts and on scientific um, methods, but they are people who care about the topic. And I think you should have this conversation then on a much um, maybe deeper level. And it should maybe not so much be on, are you right or am I right? Because that gets into a yes or no discussion. It should be about why do you think this and why do you believe in this? And then, um, and that is also for you as a researcher, it's an important question to ask. And then you should have this discussion more than trying to convince people because people who are, do, do not feel taken seriously on their beliefs and on their worries and on their fears will not, will not listen. So I think the conversation should be on a different level and um, it should be as early as you could in the research process. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're trying to um, just get your results across without having them con consulted people on the questions you're asking or the research methodologies you're using, no one will take your, your, your research results won't be, won't be implemented. Mm -hmm. And it should be, you should, you should start earlier on in your process. Very good, thank you. We have time for one more question. If we could have the last question blended in. What can be done to encourage more collaboration and empowerment of the public? Currently, the majority focus is still about informing, consulting, and involving. Um, yes. Um, we, we started with these directives because this is exactly what we think. Um, so what should, we, should be done? It should be incentivized, um, but it should also be reflected on. We should also more have more reflection on what actually, are we actually doing and are we um, reaching the goals that we are trying to reach? Um, so it's, it's about incentivizing, it's about discussing it, it's about just getting some practice. Sometimes uh, people are very happy to, to do it, but they just don't really know how to, when to start and how to start. Mm -hmm. And um, we also hope that this idea of working with these building blocks shows that there is not one right way and all the other um, ways are wrong or one configuration is the way it should be done. Um, it should be something uh, you can experiment with, um, but also then reflect on it and evaluate whether it works. And um, we hope that um, our ways of thinking can help a little bit in this um, in this endeavor. Thank you. And Flora, I just got a message. We do have uh, one more question, a very important one, and we just wanted to get that out real quick. What does the public say? How would they like to be involved is our final question for this round, please. Um, that is uh, a question I'm, it's unfortunately impossible to answer because it depends on who you're asking, what topic and in what situation. But it is a very important question to ask each time you want to do, you start, you want to involve your public. So you should ask, okay, so who are we actually asking? What do they want? And then give them this ownership, give them a say in what they want to discuss. Um, so it is a question you should actually ask every time. <laughs> <laughs> very good. And on those closing words, uh, again, I would like to thank you on behalf of everyone. Thank you very much for your presentation. Yes. Thank you for the uh, very interesting questions uh, to the audience. Yes. Yes. Great job, Janus. Thank you. For, I also have to say thank you to the audience for the excellent questions. It really is part of the success model for such a conference. So keep that up to our participants as well. Great. Thank you, Anna Fleur. And we'll be seeing you also, I believe, for our speakers corner, correct? Yes, definitely. At 2.15 Central European time. Good. Then we'll see you later. And it's time.